ever since planting a front yard garden in my yard, I had this recurring daydream of, of someone walking past it, and, and maybe they're texting their friend or taking a selfie, and all of a sudden they get whacked in the face by a homegrown tomato and they accidentally eat it. <laughs> it blows their mind, and, and maybe they, they realize for the first time that what have they been eating their whole lives? And they go plant their first front yard garden and keep that ripple of change going. And, you know, I never thought that I'd, I'd go into gardening or, or farming even. Um, after college, I was knee deep in debt, and I actually took a job in sales and cancer insurance, door to door, in the boonies of Texas. Uh, that wasn't boring. <laughs> I, uh, I would go down these mile long driveways and talk to people about cancer. And, you know, I'd say, hey, uh, you got a place we can sit down, and they say, I haven't seen a door to door salesman in 30 years. <laughs> And I was like, we still exist. And um, you know, I talked to these families about cancer, and it was, uh, it was, you know, it wasn't easy at times. But I would hear their stories about people they knew that went through it, and, and why they thought cancer was so common in our in our lives these days. Um, you know, overwhelmingly, I would hear people talk about the food we're eating, and the chemicals in our water, and in our lifestyles around us. And it just got me thinking. You know, what am I putting in my body? I started to flip over you know, read the ingredients and, and start looking at the labels of, of what, what I was feeding myself. And I realized, you know, if you can't pronounce the stuff in your food, can we really call that food? You know, so um, I started to do more research about how, where our food comes from and how it gets to our table. And I was looking at, you know, these massive monoculture farms that ship food from 1,200 miles to get to our dinner plate and coming from five countries around the world, and it just didn't seem right. It seemed like, you know, our system is broken and, you know, does it have to be this way? And I, I look back and I realized that it wasn't always this way. That, you know, there was a time when we grew our own food and we grew it in our communities and it brought people together. Um, you know, so I, uh, I, I, I didn't know exactly how I could make a change. I didn't know how I could make a difference, how I could actually, as one person, you know, actually make a lasting impact. And it was kind of overwhelming, you know, it was sort of disheartening. I felt paralyzed at times, and, um, you know, but it was right around this time I actually had a friend who was leaving town, and she gave me some seeds and uh, an organic gardening book. And I, I sprouted the seeds and, and took care of them, and with some little baby beets and some, some carrots and some Swiss chard. And, um, you know, I, when it was time for a transplant, I took them out into my backyard and found an old overgrown garden that I didn't actually even know was there. But uh, I transplanted them in the soil, and I, I watered them every day, and I got so excited. I was taking such good care of this life, you know? And it felt empowering, you know, to just to reconnect with our food and, um, and just try it out, you know? And I wasn't, you know, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I was making all kinds of mistakes, but, um, but that didn't really matter, you know? So, so finally, you know, the day came time to harvest my, uh, my first vegetable crop, and I picked up my, uh, my beets out of the ground, and my carrots, and uh, I grew these little baby carrots. <laughs> and I was like, I guess that's how they make baby carrots, you know? <laughs> no, I was falling in love with that time in the garden. It was a time to slow down. It felt like getting your hands in the dirt was, in a way, a meditation. And something that I, I didn't know I was missing in my life. But it was awesome, you know? And uh, it was right about this time I connected with uh, another organization that I had a big empty lot next to my house and for so long I, I saw it overgrown and every so often I'd, you know, I'd, I'd have to mow it or something and, and it seemed so, like such a waste of space. I was, I was hoping maybe there was something that, um, that I could do there or something that, it, that could be put it to good use. And I found this organization that, that farms in people's backyards and, and, and does, like, shares the harvest with other folks and community, it's a CSA. And um, so I, I said, hey, do you want to use this land? And, and they said, let's do it, you know? So one Saturday morning, 50 volunteers showed up, and um, we transformed the lot in a day. So uh, we, we pickaxed in the clay and mulched the whole lot. We planted 500 potatoes, fertilized them, and we still had time to share a potluck meal all in six hours. And it blew me away. I was just like, what is going on here? You know, like by 3 p.m., everyone was gone, and I was left overlooking this farm that six hours ago didn't exist. And uh, I, I was just, I was starting to think, you know, why aren't we doing this every weekend? Or why, why doesn't every street have a small little farm, you know, no matter how big or small, something to start growing our own food and reconnecting it to our communities and doing it together? And um, 
You know, right about this time, I, I took that garden that I was planting in my backyard out in front of my privacy fence. And this is how it later came to be, but it, uh, it started out as just a small 4x4 four four little front yard garden. And it was with my hands in the dirt there that it really started to transform my life. I started to talk to people as they'd be walking by or, or taking their dog on a stroll and they'd say, you know, just seeing your garden, one neighbor told me, inspired me to plant my own garden. And she even got her friends planting their first homegrown broccoli. And I, that was my first taste of this ripple effect of our actions. And I was just, I was shocked. You know, I realized that if that garden was behind my privacy fence, that my neighbor and her friends wouldn't be experiencing their first homegrown vegetables. And so it just, it started to turn, you know, turn my, my mind. And, and I got, got to thinking, like, you know, what, what is it? What is this? Uh, what is it about this small little innocent front yard garden that, that has this much bigger power than I could ever imagine? And one day walking home from the coffee shop, I, uh, I just, this vision just struck me. You know, and it was like, I just, every front yard I looked at, I just imagined a garden there. And, um, and I, I don't know what it was, but I just, I couldn't shake the vision. And I, I was like, well, maybe that's crazy, or that's impossible, you know, that could never be, be a thing, you know? And uh, I had been learning about, about these wicking bed gardens that you only have to water once every few weeks. And I started to think, like, how could I make this happen? And what are the reasons people don't garden? And for my job in sales, I realized, like, if I could eliminate the reasons that people say no to a garden, then maybe they'd be that much more likely to say yes. And so uh, I was thinking, you know, people, maybe they don't have the time, or they don't have the energy, or they don't have the money, or they say, oh, I've got a black thumb, and I failed in the past. And so I, I started to, you know, I learned about these wicking bed gardens and finding salvaged materials, old wooden pallets and political signs and burlap sacks from the coffee shop, stuff that you could find in, in any city, really. And uh, I, I built my first little wicking bed garden out of pallets, and, and I realized, like, this might work. You know, I, I think we're on to something. And even though I had sworn off door-to-door -door, uh, sales, <laughs> I ended up knocking on my neighbor's doors again. And, and I said, hey, you know, I'm the one with that front yard garden. And, that's my idea. And I realized that by making it somewhat exclusive, something special, that that might also help. So people these days believe there's no such thing as a free lunch. So I, I made these little flyers that said, you know, the first people to return these to my mailbox will get the first gardens. And I was still distributing up and down the block, and I saw this lady like, walking down the block. <laughs> put it in there, and I was like, whoa, like, this is happening, you know? And uh, so I got together with some friends, and we launched a kickoff party for Food is Free Project. And that was in January of 2012. And within five weeks, 19 out of the 30 houses on our block all hosted a front yard garden. And the idea was the neighbor could, neighbors could share the harvest with each other and get to know each other. You know, and it, it was simple, but it, it started working. And we created a new normal on our block. You know, it, it, it was something that every time I turned down that street, I smiled again and again, and it never caught old. And I, I had neighbors that were meeting for the first time in 20 years in front of their garden beds that had lived on the same block this whole time. And I was like, something is, something is, you know, there's something here. This, this, this could be a thing. So I started to blog about it and share the idea online and say, you know, this is what we're doing on our street. You know, and, and if this idea inspires you, I'd invite you to take the idea and make it your own. That idea, it took a little time to kind of, to kind of resonate with folks, but within, within nine months, we were, getting, uh, we were getting some feedback from people that were saying, hey, I, I actually, uh, is it okay if I use the name, food is free, and just try a branch of this in my community? And I said, of course, you know, like we're in this together. Let's do this. If we can create a network of support, share these ideas, learn from each other, we don't have to change the whole world. If we can focus on our little piece of the world and start there and connect with other people, we, it starts to be these beacons of light that all can connect. And, and with social media, we can share that out to the world and, and it can really inspire people to create this web of connection and interaction and community. And so, next thing I knew, I was hearing from Tasmania, Australia. I was like, this is happening. I don't even know what I did, but this little front yard garden that I planted has gone around the world. And then, next thing I knew, it came back again to a small little college town down the road in San Marcos. And I was, I, and I was just, I was floored that something so simple could really, could really make a lasting impact on people in their communities and give people a simple step that they can take to make a difference. And, uh, 
you know, time time grew and, and, and things things went on and with social media we inspired people to, you know, not everyone has a front yard or maybe not, not everyone has a whole lot of space to grow or they're growing in containers in their balcony, but we said, you know, share take take some of your harvest and put it out in a box in a public place with a hashtag and share it online and we can start to learn that, that we're not alone, that we're doing this together and that, you know, that we all have something in common and that food unites us truly. And so now over 283 cities around the world are starting projects of their own of under Food is Free. And, and it's an open source idea. It's nothing that, it's not, it's not my idea. It started with a little garden in my yard, but it's become a communal idea. It's something that's become a movement. And it's something that, you know, it, I may not know exactly what, what I was, I may not have known what I was doing in that, at that time, but it, it grew and grew and, and people started to connect over an idea. And, uh, you know, it, of course, I think part of it is just riding that wave and being open to change and open to, to giving up your idea and letting it be taken by the world. And, and you know, we all share that, that common food that, that brings us together. So if we, can, if we can find things that unite us rather than turning on the news and learning how divided we are, they say we're divided, but we're not. You know, we all share this human existence together. So if we can start there, when you're in the garden, we don't know who's a Republican and who's a Democrat. You know, we feel like we're talking about our food and our fingers have got dirt under their nails, and it's awesome, you know? And I tell people, you know, when we use these political signs, I say, we'll take Republican or Democrat signs. We're pointing that, that inward, you know? But it's, it, it doesn't matter, you know? So I'd invite you now to, as you're walking through the world, you know, just, just look around and, and imagine the way things could be. You know, it seems so solid and unchangeable these days, the world around us. It seems like it could be so hard to make a difference. But if, if we look at the gardens that could be there, you know, imagine the art that could be lining the streets, the murals, you know, the music that could be made. Hear it, you know, and, and go for it. Whatever lights you up, whatever, whatever fire, like, sparks you, you know, just, just take that first step. And there's never going to be a perfect time to do it. The time is now, so just take that first step. And, and we're all human, we're going to make mistakes. We're perfectly imperfect and that's okay. So just know that every day we're making these ripples. And, and you know, it, it doesn't matter if, uh, if, you, if you don't know exactly where you're going or where you're headed, but invite others to join you and, and say, hey, this is something that, that I'd like to share with the world and I'm not afraid to do it. So, you know, I mean, even, the, even you know, quantum physics tells us these days that that, that what seems so solid and, and unchangeable you know, is actually just waves of possibility popping in and out of existence and that our mere perception of the world can affect the reality around us. So we're co-creators in this world, so start asking, like, what do you want to create? What do we want to create? And dreams are so big it scares you and know that, that that's, that's possible. So when you're making these ripples, whatever you do, do it out in your front yard in a vulnerable place. Do it in a place that scares you because there are other people out there that need that little bit of hope, you know, and something as simple as a wave to a neighbor or a smile can literally transform someone's day and can get them dreaming again. So know that we all have that power inside of us, and when our ripples combine, we can create true waves of change.